Now you're not getting out of this place without a sermon this morning. This sermon, like I said, was meant for two weeks ago. And I thought, I probably should change it with the news coming out. And when I went back over it, went back over the lead, I said, this is perfect for this Sunday in every way. And this is a God thing. This, is, this to me, is some sort of affirmation. God knows what he's doing. Proverbs 24, 3 to 4, our theme verse. By wisdom a house is built. Through understanding it is established. That's what we're focusing on this morning. Through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Perhaps some of us need to pray that prayer today for understanding. If things are established with understanding, then we want God's church in Aurelia to be established in this community and in the kingdom, then we need God's understanding in our lives. Wisdom and understanding and knowledge, they're common themes in the book of Proverbs. They come up over and over and over again. And here they're, they're talked about with the imagery of a house being built. The stages of a house's production. We started a sermon series. Uh, it's going to look at three words in this text, and it's not wisdom and understanding and knowledge, although that was Solomon's point. It's not mine. We're going to be looking at, as we mentioned last week, not last week, my notes say last week, several weeks ago, <laughs> we're going to look at the words build, establish, and fill, or in the past tense, built established, filled. A few weeks ago, we looked at building. That's building our lives. We talked about the stones that we use that make up our lives. That is, what is it that makes up our lives? We, what convictions or beliefs, what desires and what ambitions make up our lives? What routines and habits? What makes us who we are? In the same way, we also talked about what foundation we were building on. We talked about what sort of legacy would be we'd be leaving. We talked about the foundation that our own lives would lay for others to build on. We looked at Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 3 where he speaks about Christ as the only sure, lasting, firm foundation. So we asked those questions. What are the fundamentals? of your life? What is constitutional to your life? What is your foundation or who is your foundation? That's the building process we talked about. The building blocks that make us the foundation that supports us. That's what we talked about a few weeks ago when we started this series. We mentioned also that our foundations would be shaken. They would be tested at times. Our buildings would be tested. Our lives, that is. We're speaking figuratively, of course. Our foundations will be shaken. How fitting is that for this morning? God knows what He's doing. <laughs> the foundations we've built on are what makes the difference in the face of disasters or storms or changing times. Being okay with those times. Standing firm in those times. Enduring, persevering in times of testing, in times of storm. That's what we're talking about this morning as we talk about being established. Being established. Our theme verse for the year talks about how it's through understanding that we're established. A few weeks ago, I didn't mention much about those words uh, wisdom and understanding. Even though it's very important to Solomon in, in the book of Proverbs, obviously. We were using more of the imagery that he was using in this sermon series. Here, although Solomon's use of understanding could be a synonym, it's done, he does that at other places for poetic reasons, uses different words that really he means the same thing. Here he is not using the same word. There are two different words that I cannot pronounce. But this is what they are. Wisdom is shakma, if I've written that out right. I got the Hebrew spelling right, because I copy and pasted. <laughs> Understanding is tabun, maybe. There's a shot in the dark. But they're two different words, is my point. Okay? Two different words Solomon uses here. 
as he talks about understanding and wisdom. The word understanding, we're looking at this morning, the word understanding, although sometimes it's used sort of in correlation with wisdom, when the biblical translators looked at the Hebrew or the Greek or the Aramaic and said, this word, they're trying to say understanding, the word understanding shows up over a hundred times in the Bible. It's an important word. Many of those times it's associated with wisdom, but not always. And we need to look at some of those examples to understand its importance. Now, I'm not going to give you a hundred this morning. Maybe I should. Maybe I should give you a hundred. That'll help some of you to say, you know what, if you need to leave sooner than the end of June. <laughs> I won't give you a hundred this morning. But there are some important ones. When Israel was first choosing its leaders from among the tribes, they were called to choose wise and understanding and respected people from every tribe and set them over you. That's what God says to, Abraham, to Moses in Deuteronomy 1 and 13. They need to have understanding. Your leaders need to have understanding. In fact, when Solomon, the one who writes the, our theme verse, the one who writes the majority of the Proverbs, when he was given wisdom from God, in 1 King 4 and 29, we see that happen. And we're told that he was given wisdom, yes. That's what we talk about. He got, he's given wisdom. But here's how the verse reads. He's given wisdom and great insight. So it seems to me even more insight than wisdom. Wisdom, great insight. And here's what it says. A breath of understanding as measureless as the sand of the seashore was given to Solomon. That's a lot of understanding. Understanding is important. It's important. Isaiah 5 and 13 tells us that one of the reasons the people ended up in exile, and they were carried into exile, I love that, one of the reasons they ended up in exile was because God says, Isaiah 5 and 13, for lack of understanding. When we look at the Gospels, when we look at Jesus, one of the things that set Jesus apart, one of the things that said, oh, he has such authority was his understanding in Luke's Gospel. That beautiful story where he's just a young person, just, I think, 12 years old in the temple. And they're listening to him teach, and they're saying, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding. Now, there's a point to me emphasizing this word this morning. And as it relates to being established, it's in our theme verse that we're established by understanding. There's a point to labor on this word. So I want to linger just for a moment longer on it. Because we need to note before we move on where this word is mentioned the most in the Bible. Outside of Proverbs. The word understanding comes up the most in Proverbs. The second most often book. It's not the Psalms. It's not any of the epistles where they were trying to lead the church and guide the church. It's the book of Job. The book of Job. And if you know the story of the book of Job, <laughs> he was a life that was shaken and broken. His foundations were rocked to the core. He faced constant trial and testing and hardship, but he endured. Job, while he had good days, more bad days, which is understandable. He was established. His life was built on trust and hope in God, and he had far, had far, had far less to do with his circumstances, his outlook. His circumstances didn't always affect his demeanor. There were days they did. He was only human. But they certainly didn't affect his purpose, his feeling and sense of purpose and meaning. And ultimately, though he questions God and why, they don't affect his faith, his circumstances. He was established. He had understanding. Well, others thought they did. His friends, you heard of Job's comforters, right? We use the term sometime. His friends thought they knew what was best and they were trying to tell him. And they lacked understanding when Job really was the one who had it best. He was established by understanding. 
A house is established. There are some things that we need to understand in order to be established ourselves. Job, in Job 36 and 27, he says, How great is God? In the midst of all this, how great is God? He is beyond our understanding. And yet we try. And yet we strive to understand His Word, to understand His ways, to understand His will for our lives as best we can. In order to be the best and most established that we can in our lives. We need those senses of understanding to work on that understanding of who God is, of what He's doing. We're established in and through Him. Job's story is a great segue into our actual text for this morning, which we, we won't spend too, too much time on. Caitlin read so well for us. I've referenced this text before. And frankly, verse 11 is one of the most well-known, most quoted verses in the whole Bible that I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's important for us. It's more important for us, for some of us this morning, to hear those and believe those words. And I'm so grateful for how they've been repeated, how they've been portrayed by Colonel Gwen, by Caitlin in the reading. I've said in sermons before, that we often forget. Because this is such a good verse, and it's so meaningful, and it's so hopeful, and we, we put it on our walls, that we so often forget the context of the verse. And I've, I brought it up in sermons before. The context of this verse is the people were in exile. And they cried out to God from exile. And from exile they said, Lord, save us. Lord, help us. As they've done so often before, they'd ask for, ask for deliverance, and God says, no. No. Not what they wanted to hear. Sometimes we get news we don't want to hear. No is never what God's people want to hear. If you've been going to church or Bible studies, you would have heard preachers and teachers tell you, you've heard me tell you, that sometimes God's answer to prayers is no. And that's an understanding that we have. It's an understanding we have, and yet it's hard to understand. Do you follow what I'm saying? We have the understanding, but it's hard for us to fully comprehend it. Why it's that way. All loving, all powerful... Why does the answer have to be no? <laughs> we don't like being told no. Not surprising. We're God's children. That's, I have children. They ask for things. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes they're sure they need it. Sometimes they're sure it should be that way. But when Kathleen and I say no to them, it's because we feel that we know what's best for them. And we feel that, right now, the best possible answer to that request for their good is no. And if we're God's children, I don't think it works too different from that. And I feel like so often, God, who knows what's best, gives us that answer, and we question it. But He has our best interest in mind. He is completely good. And if we understand how it works in family dynamics, how parents sometimes say, no, for the children's good, then how come we can't understand it when God says it for our good? But I'm the same way. I'm there sometimes too, friends. We don't want to know. It's hard. Ask the Israelites in Babylon. It's hard. It's hard. God says, no. God, help us. God, save us. We're sorry. We'll follow your ways, Israel cries out, as they cried out over and over and over again. It's the story of the Old Testament. It's the entire book of Judges. I've said this before in a sermon, where the people... 
things are going good and, and they get away from God. They, they move away from God. They turn away from God because things are great. They don't need Him anymore. And then they cry out to Him when they're taken over by enemy armies. They cry out, God, save us. And God rises up a judge. He rises up a hero. He rises up your Samson or your Deborah or your Gideon. And He frees them. And they're, they're rejoicing in God for the moment until everything is good again. And they turn, it's, it's the entire book of Judges. And it's beyond just Judges. So often people have these Hosanna moments. Hosanna moments. Like the people when they welcome Jesus, right? M many of the same people, less than a week later, were shouting crucify, rather than Hosanna. Hosanna moments. Please save us. That's the original meaning of Hosanna. Words change over time, but the original meaning of Hosanna, Yasha'ana, is found in Psalm 118 and 25, abbreviated by the rabbis to Hosanna. It means please save, or Lord save us, but there's this element of please in it. Please save us, or save now. Hosanna. And that is the one cry that we see that God has been faithful to over and over and over again. And yet here as we read Jeremiah 29, God seems at first glance to respond to that cry with no. But it's not fair to say that God didn't answer their prayer. He didn't answer their prayer in the way they expected or wanted, perhaps. They didn't, he didn't answer their prayer in the way that they were saved immediately from Babylon. But perhaps his response... His direction was what they needed at that time. And what was his direction? And what was his decree? Establish yourselves. We ask God for things because we assume it's, it's best or it's what we need or it's the only means to some end. God knows best. God knows what we really need and He responds faithfully to that real need. God didn't answer people it's prayer for the Messiah to come and free them from Rome and be an earthly king. No, he sent Jesus Christ to save us from sin, to give us hope of eternal life, because that's what we really needed. He's who we really need. People will sometimes try to tell us different. People will challenge us. Where is your God? People challenge Job. Job's own friends did. His wife did. Some of... of Jesus' own would-be followers did. You're, call, call yourself down. In our text in Jeremiah, God warns the people. He says, don't believe those folks who come feeding you what you want to hear. Basically what he says. He says, the dreams that you want them to dream, don't believe those folks. I haven't sent those folks. I, I, this time I'm here with the hard lesson of the hard truth. I haven't sent them. No, this is my message. This is my word to you. I will not bring you out. Not yet. First, establish yourselves. Verses 5 and 6. He says, Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry, have sons and daughters. Establish yourselves. Seventy years, he says, they say, free us, Lord, save us, Lord, for 70 years. Establish yourselves. And if Babylon prospers in those 70 years, you will prosper. Establish yourselves. And then, verse 10, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, for Babylon, interesting word, choice two, I'll come back to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back. I will bring you back. And then there's those beautiful words. We're coming to a close. Soon, church. And they come on those beautiful words again. Message for this morning, a message for us, for the people down and for us today. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then, then, after you've established yourself... You'll call on me. You'll come pray to me and I will listen. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me 
with all your heart, I will be found by you. Lord, answer prayer. Establish yourselves. Persevere and trust. This was God's calling to his people then and now. And, and to their credit, before we close, to their credit, there's lots of great stories that come out of Babylon because they settled for that time. Synagogues began there. They were, were reminded them, themselves of who they were and whose they were in the midst of Babylon. And in time, as promised, God brings them home. And you know how he does it? He uses the king of Babylon himself. And I wonder to myself, if 70 years before, if they had rioted and had an uprising with God, you know, God help us, we're going to fight this and we're going to go home, would that have ever happened that way? The king of Babylon says, you know what, I'm going to pay your way back. You know what, I'm going to pay for the building of your temple. That's amazing, friends. And I wonder, is that not why God said, establish yourself, make sure Babylon prospers, because you will prosper. You see how God works? There's got to be a connection there. And we don't see it until afterwards. So often we look back and we say, God is so faithful. Why am I so faithless sometimes? In the moment, God help us. We believe, help us in our unbelief to be established in our faith in our lives. We need to have more than just Hosanna moments. We need to be, have understanding when we're facing our trials or changes to know who we are and whose we are and to hold for, firm to those truths when storms rage, when times of trial and testing come, or when the answer is no. To work and prosper our land Prosper our neighbors, not just ourselves. Maybe, friend, you're in Babylon now. You feel that way. Uneasy, uncomfortable, perhaps there's some sort of unrest, or there has been. Maybe this new news is still burdening you. It's still burdening me. Maybe there's other things in your life. Kathleen and I aren't the center of the universe. There's all kinds of hurts in this place right now, beyond this. And I acknowledge those this morning. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're facing this morning, God hears your prayer. And He does answer our Hosanna cries, Lord, save us. He does answer, not always in the way He wants. Sometimes He says, establish yourself, build here. Trust and hope and know that I am God. And I've got a plan for you, a hope and a future for you. You just need to deal right now with this present. Sometimes that's the answer. But God is with you there. Friends, God is with you there. He didn't leave his people to his own, their own devices in Babylon. He didn't say, you know what, no. Uh, sweat it out, I'll see you in 70 years. You have these amazing stories of people saved from lion's dens and saved from fiery furnaces while they were in Babylon. In exile, God was there. He was there. He even let His own temple that He had built for His own glory be destroyed, but not His people. Not His people. Never. Trust and believe and have faith, friends. God is faithful and God is good. He is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. He's the rock on which we build and which we establish ourselves. How well are you established this morning? We're going to sing the song so I've kept you long enough. Sing it from time to time. I love it very much. You are my strength when I am weak. And you are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I'm weak, when I'm dry, you fill my cup. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Praise and glory and honor because you're faithful and you're good. Help us to trust in you, Lord.
Help us to trust in you. Help us to bring to you whatever we come to this place bearing. This place of prayer is open if you want to come and you want to lay something down here. Maybe you're struggling with, with something this morning beyond just this news. You can come and pray. Maybe you've never ever prayed that Hosanna prayer, Lord save. You can come and do that. The Lord saves. Amen? Amen. Let's sing and let's pray. Jesus, Lamb of God.